student without a book and while it's on my mind brother Steve I won't be here next Sunday morning so if we have a preacher can you take chapter 2 if you'll be here I'm planning to be here so okay. I'll, I'll plan on that I just wanted to, that's business in class but I wanted to get it out of the way I want to talk about some definitions before we begin our study on love. In English, I, we probably have two words that we might use, but of course love is a broadly used term. If I say I love cheesecake, that's not saying it's like I would be saying I love my wife, and it's certainly not saying what I would say if I say I love God. So we have kind of one word, but then we use the word affection, don't we? That's kind of a, a, a maybe a secondary term. In the Greek language, of course, in which our New Testament was written, uh, in the Greek language, there are four different words for love. Even though we may not all call, maybe some people would. Um, the first one in scripture that we think about probably is st if you want to put some notes in your bible i did in mind s-t-o-r-g-e storge s-t-o-r-g-e storge is familial love so that's like the love you have in your family uh, and that's used in scripture um, and so philemon <coughs> the, 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 in his name the word is love there word love is there and then the next word is, is uh, I'm sorry I said storge then philia b-h-i-l-i-a is the next word and that's more like brotherly love Philadelphia. like Philadelphia the city of brotherly love yeah good observation and um, and so that that's like maybe uh, the love you might have for a really good friend 
Uh, that's what Peter said to Jesus at the end of John's Gospel. He said, Peter, do you love me? Well, the next word is agape. That's the word God, God's love for us. But Peter says, well, I phileo you, Lord. In other words, I have brotherly affection for you. And, it, and, and then, so then finally Peter says, well, I mean, Jesus finally said, do you really have brotherly affection for me, Peter? So they, see, they had different meanings. And it, it, so the next word is agape. Agape is the John 3.16 love. For God so loved the world. God's love is above everybody's love, and we learn from that. Then the next word that is not in Scripture, but it is a Greek term, and it's it's the word eros, and you it's a, it had it can be the right kind of love in marriage, romantic love. It can also be used in a very vulgar way, but that word's not in our New Testament. So those three words, and so when you think about loving people, the reason I bring up these definitions, if I want to develop a habit of a loving heart, I need to understand what I mean when I say I love somebody. Um, I love steak, especially when it's the way I want it cooked. And and I love my wife's cooking. And, and I'm not sure which word I would use, perhaps, you know, in English. But you know that's not the same thing as saying, I love the Lord. Very different, very different. So when we use the word love in our study, try to think, well, how do I love this person? Do I love them kind of like, well, we're good buddies. But I, or do I have the love of God for that person? That is, do I have their best interest at heart? And there's a difference, yes, sir? Is agape love only attributed to Deity? No, no, because the Bible teaches us to have that kind of love for one another. Yeah, that's a good question. But God teaches us, you know, whenever you read passages like, well, since, you know, God loved us, I think it's 1 John three sixteen. we ought to love one another. And so we should learn from God how to love people more than just like a good buddy. I'll go fishing with a good buddy. If I love my good buddy, I'll talk to him about Jesus. Yes, sir. Which form is used in Paul's treatise about love? Agape. Okay. Yeah. Now, sometimes the Bible talks about brotherly love, and that would be phileo or philia. Don't worry about whether you get the spelling right. You get the idea of the difference, nuance, different nuances of the, the word. It's like... You love your children, if you really love them, you'll have their best interest right. at heart, spiritually, right. won't you? And yet you can also love them, you enjoy being with them. The family love, it's, and your family's important to you. Then I wanna look at another definition. The title of our book is Habits, Habits of a Loving Heart. And I'm sure most of you could defi define the word habit. I looked up a couple definitions, <clears throat> and one of them is habit is a behavior that is repeated regularly and tends to occur subconsciously. I like that definition. That and so so a habit could be a good habit, can be a bad habit, and it's like you know I do that all the time. I don't even think about it. Well, you know. There are things that you do habitually that you don't think about. Should love, the what we're studying this subject, having the love that God has for us and us learning to love other people that way, should that become a, become a subconscious habit? But that would be a hard thing to do for it to be. But it might, you may be doing that more than you realize. Another definition is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. So that could be something that you should not have a habit of. Um, how many of you have had what you would call bad habits, but you broke the habit? Yeah, and you're glad you broke that habit. Amen. And, and, so, and so 
But this is, we're not talking about those habits necessarily. It's looking at the word and the meaning of it. So we're on page one of our book, Habits of a Loving Heart. And I, I, I like the story that Brother Tate began with, uh, Norma Jean Mortensen, one of the most famous people of the last century. Her mother had emotional and mental problems, so her mother was in and out of mental institutions regularly, and Norma Jean spent a lot of time in orphanages. And a lot of times people who are orphans go, they may go to several different ones. You know, if they can find good foster parents, that's a blessing, but she did not. And in one of those places, when she was eight years old, she was, she was raped. And the man gave her a nickel not to tell anybody. This is way back. And so she told uh, her house parent about it, and the house parent said, that man pays good money for his rent. Don't you ever say anything else bad about him. And, and so, the, so, you know, she went through a lot of, of abuse and beatings, and she was not, didn't feel free to express her bad spirits or her hurt. That affects a young person deeply. And I was talking to someone recently who was talking about their upbringing and how they didn't have a good upbringing and they were beaten. And I told that person, I said, I feel so blessed I did not experience that growing up. My parents loved me. I never had bad experience, but some people have. And it affects them deeply. And so as Norma Jean's time went along, she got a little older, she started maturing as a young woman, started getting to be very pretty, and the boys would whistle at her, but she wished they would pay attention to her for her, for her personality and things like that instead of just her body and her appearance. And of course, you know, um, finally Hollywood got a hold of her. If you know who I'm talking about, you already know the end of the story. We're gonna make a sex symbol out of you and, and we're gonna make you the most sizzling sex symbol ever. Evidently, this person was very attractive and, and, and she says a symbol says, isn't that something people crash together to make noise? And he said, that doesn't matter. We're gonna make a sizzling star out of you. Well, you know, later she changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. So I don't like Elton John but in his song, he talks about Norma Jean. Maybe you've heard, so that's who he's talking about. Um, but the point is, she became a star, but people only wanted her for her looks. And she played in a lot of movies. And, and yet, what do most men, especially carnally-minded men, think about when they think about Marilyn Monroe? A sex symbol. That's what they made out of her. Unfortunately, at age 35, she took enough sleeping pills to take her life. And the, the maid, or someone found her the next morning, the phone was off the hook. She had tried to call one of her Hollywood people, friends, and to tell him what she had done, and supposedly he quoted Clark Gable from Gone with the Wind, not using his words, it's really, I don't care. And I think, well, those are the last words that she heard. So the, the reason that Brother Tate used that illustration is he, he raised the question, well, what if somebody had taken this little girl and loved her? It really breaks my heart to think about people abusing children. If you were raised with good parents, be thankful to God. If you were raised and abused, be thankful you're not suffering that anymore. And there's a God that loves you, whether anybody else does or not. And we as God's people have to learn how to love people. And I think people who've been, I don't think, I know people who've been through traumatic experiences need a little more love and attention and give it to them. That's all right. Give them some attention. And, and because I think, 
not deviating too much from the book, we're going to get some scriptures. A lot of young people are on drugs, are stealing, are going out here burning buildings, and staying and and uh, staying in trouble because they've never been loved. That's not an excuse for the things they do once they learn right from wrong, but it kind of helps you understand. Why? Because they're looking for attention. And I've never seen a child yet that didn't want it. You asked about, uh, us about Lavinia, our little granddaughter. She, she craves attention. Matthias, I don't know that he, but she does. And I think, well, that's all right. But give them the right kind. What if somebody had taken somebody like Norma Jean and adopted her and taught her about the Lord? had raised her on Bible stories and singing, Oh, how I love Jesus, or Jesus loves me, this I know, or the Bible tells me so. So I want to think about this. Okay, we can't do anything about Marilyn Monroe, but there are a lot of people like that. Can we learn to love people? I think our culture does not understand it. Let me rephrase that. I know our culture doesn't understand it. Because love is probably the most abused word in our culture, probably worldwide. Steve? As far as current culture, I don't watch these shows, I'm not familiar with a couple of like either dating shows or the winner gets to marry somebody or something. And it's such an abuse of even the concept of a relationship. It's just it's all superficial. And yes. And The erotic kind of love, that's an abuse of the idea of love. That's nothing but sinful passion out of control if it's outside of marriage. And if you think there's not a problem with pornography, you look up how much money the porno pornography industry makes every year. Somebody's paying for it. And, and they're looking for something. If I get that desperate, I'm going to call somebody. If I get that desperate, I'm going to I'm going to have a meeting with one of my friends or more. Say I, I'm struggling here. I don't, but I'm just saying if you get to the point where that kind of thing is drawing your attention, get some help. Don't let it go to seed. Now let's go to John chapter 13 for a few minutes this morning. This section of scripture probably lasted for no more than four to five hours from John 13 through John 17. If you study it, the whole situation here is Jesus and his disciples. And this is John's, it's not John's dis discussion of the Lord's Supper. John doesn't even mention the Lord's Supper anywhere. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do, but John does it. But this, the setting here is at that time when Jesus, they were having the last Passover as Jews, and Jesus, it would have been the same setting, but something different's going on here. And, and John is so unique. And John talks about love more than any of the other gospel writers. And I think the word love in 1 John, just those five chapters, is in that, that little book at least 45 times in one way or another. John talked about love. We need to know what it is from a biblical perspective so we can know how to have a habit of a loving, what's the title of our book? Habits of a loving heart. A loving heart. It's not going through the motions it's not trying to impress your girlfriend so she'll go out with you again when you're dating or your boyfriend so he'll ask you again, but it's the kind of love that learns to be sacrificial. So we, in the first part of John 13, we see it's before the feast of the Passover. Uh, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, and having, look, look at the first the latter part of verse 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end or to the uttermost, depending on your translation. It's like 
Jesus never stopped loving these men. Now, when you start looking at Jesus working with these disciples, we have a phrase that I heard growing up. They were wet behind the ears spiritually. They had a lot to learn. And sometimes I find a little water behind mine. I'm still learning, okay? Because I've not reached where Jesus is yet. But God has come here in the form of a man, and who else to show us love than that? And, but here's the thing. I want you to see, knowing what Jesus knew, and this is where his love starts to kind of shine, as it were, Knewing, knowing, I'm in verse 1, that his hour had come that he would depart out of this world to the Father. Let me ask you something. What had to happen before he would depart out of this world? What had to happen to him first? He had to go through the trials, the, cruci the beating, the crucifixion. He had to go through all of that. So it's kind of a... He, and so just, just right after this, he's arrested. You read the gospel accounts of the Lord's Supper, and he introduces it, and they go to the, to the, to the garden to pray, and, and that's where Judas brings the soldiers, and he's arrested. He knows that's about to happen. Jesus is never inconvenienced when love is needy, needed to be practiced. And it's, hard, it's easy to say that about him. But when you talk about us, inconvenience, it's like, well, I don't know if I can do that or not. I've got to polish my fishing rod. I mean, you know what I'm saying. It's like, or we, we have these things we get sidetracked to, and Jesus would not be, so I can learn from him to do better, can't I? Now, so, so he knew he was about to die, but he loved them. And so... Judas, the Bible says the devil had put it in the heart of Judas to betray the Son of Man. That word betray means to give him up. It's like, you ever have somebody rat on you in school for doing something? That's betray to give you up, and that's what Judas did. But also he knew in verse 3 that the Father had given all things into his hands. His power. His power. He had the authority. And it's chapter 17 and verse 2 of John. He speaks, Jesus is praying. He says, talking to the Father, you've given me authority over all flesh. Here's the point. He knew he was going to die, but he had all authority. He didn't have to do this. But the, the love of God compelled him to do it. That's the habit I want to develop, Brenda. I want to have the habit of loving people, and it's not going to be an easy lesson to learn, but if I get anything out of it, I'll be better. And so he gets up from the supper. You know how the scene plays out, and he gets up from the supper, and he dresses himself like a household slave and performs a task. If my, if my research is correct, which I don't always know that it is, but if my research is correct, depending on the situation, a lot of times people wash their own feet. The slave did not necessarily have to wash people's feet. Maybe in some places they did, but be that as it may, the deed should have already been taken care of. Would you go into, would you come into this church building for worship with mud all over your boots? No. You'd take them off at least and leave them outside. Uh, but it's kind of like that. And, and I, am, I don't know that I'll ever understand why they had gone to the Passover with dirty feet. I don't, maybe somebody can help me with that sometime. But be that as it may, Jesus used it as an opportunity. And he dresses himself up like a slave, takes a basin and a towel, and one by one washes their feet. And of course, Peter said, you're not going to do that, Lord. And you know how the scene played out. But then I want you to notice. So it's so foot washing in some churches has come from this. It was not intended to be a, uh, a ritual. It was, a, it was an object lesson. And uh, it would be like, 
I'm visiting somebody. And their toilet stopped up. And I volunteer to take care of that in somebody else's house. It's an object lesson, okay? Or somebody vomited, and I volunteer to clean it up. I'd have to hold my breath. But it, it's, it's an act that's beyond the ordinary, isn't it? And so, but he asked the question at the latter part of verse 12, do you know what I've done to you? And the first grader would say, yeah, you washed our feet. But that's not really what he was asking, was it? What was he asking, Brenda? Are you going to do it? Are you going to do as I say? Okay. What do you, what do you hear him asking, Linda? Humility. Humility. Do you know what I've done? It's not simply that he washed their feet, but what have I done? Service. 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 Humility. Love. Love. And it's not like they could have gone through the meal with dirty feet. They wouldn't have stopped the Passover. You know, he, he so demonstrates what Paul talks about in his wisdom, even in doing this, how Jesus just he emptied himself to love and serve us. He emptied himself. And there's our example, isn't it? Yes, mate. When he's asking the question, he's not asking for an answer. He's asking them to reflect on what he's done. Thank you. That's exactly right. And and if you do some research sometimes, Jesus asked a lot of questions. That is a way to learn how to teach. Instead of telling people, ask them questions. Do you understand what we talked about today? Do you have any questions about our discussion? And that way, you know, so he said, now look at verse 13. Uh, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, so I am. I uh, started my <coughs> class with Jamaica School of Preaching, my part of it this past Wednesday. I have a new student I've never had before. I've had I have four, three of them I'd had before, and one of them posted a comment on Facebook, and uh, I just, I didn't answer his question. I figured somebody else could, you know. And I said, hello there, Brother Ian. He said, hello, professor. Now, I could let that go to my head. But that's a, that's a term of respect. Yeah. Well, Jesus was far above that, wasn't he? Right. But he, so look at it. He knew he was about to die. He knew the power he had. He knew the position he was in. And I am your teacher, and I'm your Lord. Right here is probably one of the forms of teaching that we all can learn. Teaching is not just words, is it? Right. And he says, if I then, he didn't say this, but God in the flesh, Lord and the teacher, Wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, you need to learn how to love each other. Jesus was not specifically talking about washing feet as he was serving one another. Um, and that may be an area where you need to work. I know it's an area that I need to do some work on because in COVID, in this seclusion, we can become very comfortable in seclusion. Before that, we could be, now it's even a greater challenge. And naturally, we want to keep our distance from people to some degree. But at the same time, we can't be scared to death. But look at verse 15. For four, I gave you an example, there it is, that you should do as I did to you. Truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master. So see, he took on that role himself nor is the one who sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are what if you do them? Blessed. If you know these things, great. Do them and you'll be blessed. That's, it's, that's the next level. It is very easy to read the announcements and say, we need to check on so-and-so. It's easy. I can tell you, I stand up here and say that all day. But to check on so-and-so 
is different, isn't it? If it's by a call or a card or a visit, even if you have to stand in the yard and talk to somebody on the porch, it could go a long way. Feet on your prayers, yeah, and I got that from somebody else. But yeah, put feet on your prayers, yes. Now, I want you to turn over here. So, look over here at verse 34. You have to read all of this. He talks about his betrayal, but look at verse 34. Lisa, what does that say? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You know, I want to look at verse 35 in a minute. But look at what he said. I want you to learn from this so you can teach a good Bible class with it someday. Is that what he said? I want you to love one another even as I have loved you. I want to back up to the time right after John baptized him and right after he came out of the wilderness of temptation and he started handpicking these. His love for them began to go into action when he started picking these folks that were, Peter was rough. In Tennessee, maybe down here too, we'd say he was rough as a cop. And so, but look what he, let's just take that for an example and how Jesus loved Peter and what he put up with. <clears throat> no, Lord, you're not going to die. Wait a minute. God just said he was going to die, and Peter says you're not. He said, you get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. But he didn't give up on him, you see. He taught him, but he didn't give up on him. Love will not give up on people unless they refuse to talk to you or they die or move. And it may take this long, time-wise, to reach some people. It might, you remember Brother Larry telling this story that he had taught some men the gospel in Korea in the 1960s and maybe five or six years ago this man called him and said he had just become a Christian. So you don't put a clock on it or a calendar. You don't give up. And it's and love is, and in 1 Corinthians 13, one of the qualities of love is it is patient or long-suffering. Yes. We watched the movie uh, Friday night and Saturday, and um, there was one uh, conversation or phrase in there, but it said, when a person is resisting you or pushing you away, maybe that's the time to push more their direction and love more and What do you think about that? That's not a Bible quote, but somebody resists. You know, I've heard people tell me about evangelistic efforts, that somebody would push. He said, I just pushed back. I wouldn't quit, and they finally gave in. I think maybe we, maybe that, maybe we're not, maybe we're not persistent enough. I believe it's 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade people, persuade men. And so Jesus spent a lot of time with Peter. And Peter finally got it, didn't he? And he didn't let him get away with anything either. And you know, he could have walked off anytime he wanted to. The Lord didn't force him. Yes, sir. Just looking at the love Jesus had, and like you said, he he looked at the, the potential that Peter had. He looked at the good things, but he also loved him enough to, to rebuke him. And, 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 we, and we have to be plain spoken, if you will, about the truth and where people are and where we are as well. So I think it was James Dobson that wrote a book called Tough Love, and it has some good principles in it. So back to our, our study. we got about, what, about 10 minutes left. That's good. Um, how do we start applying some things like this? Um, they said that Marilyn Monroe became kind of arrogant, and, but then she would stay in her dressing room for a long time, make everybody wait on her, but they said because she was scared to death. 
Sometimes people don't want to talk to you because they're scared to death. Love will try to understand where people are. Yes, ma'am. I just, when I read verse 34 and 35, it says, you love one another and all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love one another. I think sometimes we miss some of what that's saying because surely there were other people in that society that loved. But Jesus says, I want your love to be so much more that it stands out. I try to be careful about the things I say in public, but I'm going to say this in love. Back in the 1950s, there began to be a movement in the Lord's Church against churches overseeing an orphan's home. You may remember some of that. And some brethren say, you can't do that out of the church treasury. Some say, well, James 1.27 says, we are supposed to take care of the widows and orphans. He didn't say how. And it became, it came, the discussion became, well, this can be done by individuals, but it can't be done by the church. Last time I checked, the church was made up of individuals. And but, but Jesus is saying one way, and, and that, that hurt the church. We're still divided over it. Not as many of the people that opposed it are around now. And we have to love them, too. Can't hate people. That's wrong. But somehow, one way or another, without violating Scripture, we need to, as God's people, help people in need. We cannot feed the world. We cannot, and I do not believe in feeding somebody who's too lazy to work. That goes around from church to church to church looking for handout, but they don't want to listen to the gospel. I, there's a point where you just say, look, we, but if somebody's really in need and we reach out as God's people and help them, people will know about it. And they'll say, That's, those people care about folks. I think we get caught up in things sometimes that have hurt us, that difference in those approaches to how you use the Lord's money. Uh, I'm not here to debate that. I'm talking about Jesus said, if you help people and one another, it be, you know, charity, the old phrase goes, charity begins at where? Home. You learn how to be charitable and loving at home, you can learn how to help people who are not Christian. And we have some who are Christians that they may, may need somebody to just love them and let them know we still care. As long as there's still breath in their body and their brain is still functioning, they're still with us, aren't they? So what do we learn here? What are some things we might do to, without calling out anybody's names, anything like that, but just some things. What are some things we might, let's just take it as individuals. Whether the church does it or not, an individual has responsibility. What are some things we can do to show love to our brethren? Call them, send them cards, go visit. Do something they need, like whether it's a ride to the doctor. A ride to the doctor. Cutting grass. Cutting their grass. That's right. And yes, Linda. We're supposed to be doing all men, especially those in household faith. Galatians 6 10. That's right. And Paul didn't say whether that was the church or an individual. Let us. He didn't say how. And so I'm, I'm convinced if the church wants to do something collectively to help somebody, Galatians 6 10 tells us we can. We have to be judicious. But we can, we can know the difference in a need and somebody that lives off of people. But I, I think we have to be careful and not let that latter part be an excuse not to do. You know, well, they're just beggars. Well, you know what? Beggars need Jesus, too. And if they come up to the church building and I'm here and they're looking for a handout, say, well, you know, I don't really handle that. 
if you need some lunch today, I'll buy you lunch. But, you know, I don't carry a lot of cash most of the time, but I said, I'll take up here and buy you something to eat. Now, if you want me to pay your electric bill, you're gonna have to talk to the treasurer about that, maybe. And I would just ask them, say, could you help me understand maybe why you think you're in this situation? I'm not judging you, I'm just trying to help you. And you know, some people just don't know how to manage money. They have no clue. And, and they may need some help in that area. But so I'm not judging you, I'm just saying, can we help you learn how to handle your situation? Would you like not having to do this? I think that's showing love to people. And then eventually you'll get around and say, well, can we study the Bible together, learn how to become a Christian, and see how the church works, not from the outside, but from the inside. But then what can we do? Uh, we can probably do more than we think. And it's not a matter of how many. We were studying David's mighty men in the class this past week, and one of his name was one of the men was Adino. And I forget how many men he killed by himself. The point is, one man can do a lot if put forth the effort. So, thinking about John 13, look over here in in chapter 15 and verse 12. Jesus. See, this, so remember John 13 through 16 is all the same setting with Jesus' discussion. In John 17, I believe the disciples are there, but Jesus is praying. So this is still part of this long conversation. Uh, and look at verse 10. Verse 9 and 10. Just as the Father sent me, I have also loved you. What did he say? Abide in my love. Having a habit, I'm in John 15, 9. John 15, 9. Um, abide in my love. Having a habit is perhaps something that you learn to do subconsciously. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you just started loving and doing and didn't even have to think about it? It's just your routine. Well, it's up to us whether we want it to be that way. But Jesus says, abide in my love. I am afraid that we've kind of narrowed that down to, well, I was in Sunday school, I was in worship, I took the Lord's Supper, I put my money in a collection plate, and I worked hard all week. And I might be there for Bible class on Wednesday night, and we've kind of limited it to that. You think I could be on target to some degree? Yeah, we can, we can let that be the extent of our love. No, love goes goes beyond these assemblies that these assemblies what do we see in Hebrews 10 24 and uh, that that we come together to stir up love and good deeds or good works and so that's a part of what we're supposed to be doing you remember Clint Black the singer love is something that you do I immediately thought of 1 Corinthians 13. Love is something that you do. And uh, it's a way of living, it's a way of thinking. It just comes about, you know, maybe sometimes when we see these people on the side of the road, we got, we're about a minute out of our class time, but okay, they're probably going around from, you know, exit to exit ramp, they may be making their money like that. Back about five or six years ago, there was a fellow at Walmart or Sam's on Norman Drive, one of those places. I think it was at, by the Walmart. I think Ellie was with me, and he was, he's a rambler, you know, highway man. And he was asking for help, and I talked to him a little bit. And I'm not bragging about anything. I thought, I'll never see this man again. And I gave him a copy of that book, Into the Abundant Life. I said, if you really want to stop living this way, this will take you in that direction. There has to be a, but, but you see, you gotta think like that, right? We have to think that way. 
If we run out of those, if you got put some of those books in your car or muscle in a shovel or this transform, put it in your car. Uh, I was supposed to meet a man the other day about some tools he was selling. And I ended up meeting him at a, I think I told you about it. And I, the lady that was in this title office, I said, I'm going to sit in here and wait on him because he never showed up. But uh, I gave her a copy of Muscle and a Shovel. What she does with it, it's up to her. But we got to love people's souls too. I probably, I, and I'm thinking, you know, I know where she is. If I see that little blue Hyundai sitting outside, I can stop in there and call her by name because she's named the same name as one of my children. Say, did you read the book? Love will do that. It has time for it. I'm talking to myself now, but it has time for it. Yes, sir. I was just thinking of Peter's response when he saw the, the, the lame man who was begging. He, he looked at what was really more what the man needed the most. He needed the Lord. We're going to have to stop, but. Uh, next week, start on page 7 for chapter 2, doing the right thing for the right reason.